the veranda on top of your place, your, pa your palace for the fast day that the sacred wheel treasure, it will appear to you. It is a thousand spoked, complete with fellow, it has a thousand spokes on it with a fellow, a hub and all of the apparatuses. So this was something historically that existed that was ruling, used by rulers to rule the world when everything was working perfectly. Now, when it works, here's the good ruling. Here's how it was working. What sire is the duty of an Aryan wheel turning monarch? It is this, my son, yourself, depending on the Dhamma, honoring it, revering it, cherishing it, doing homage to it and venerating it, having the Dhamma as your badge and your banner, acknowledging the Dhamma as your master, you should establish guard, ward, and protection according to the Dhamma for your own household, for your troops, for your nobles and your vassals, for the Brahmins and the householders, for the town and the country folk, ascetics and Brahmins, for all the beasts and all the birds, and let no crime prevail in your kingdom and to those who are in need, give them property and Whatever ascetics and Brahmins in your kingdom have renounced the life of sensual infatuation and are devoted to forbearance and gentleness, each one taming himself, each one calming himself, and each one striving for the end of craving, if from time to time that they should come to you and consult you as to what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, what is blameworthy and what is blameless, they will come and ask what is, the, is to be followed and what is not to be followed. And what action will in the long run lead to harm and sorrow and what is the, in, to which one to welfare and happiness. And you should listen and tell them to avoid evil and do what is good. And that, my son, is the duty of the Aryan uh, wheel-turning monarch. So the monarch or the leader of the country here is responsible for guidance for the people, for long life, safety, and happiness. And he said yes, and he listened to this and listened about the fast days and what he was to do. And then the king said, do not take life. Be sure that you do not take life. He, he says to his son, the precepts, do not take what is not given. Do not commit sexual misconduct. Do not tell lies in any way and do not drink strong drink. Be moderate in your eating. And those who had opposed him in the Eastern regions, they became his subjects when he spoke of them this way. And he did not have to conquer them in a rough way is what they're talking about. And the wheel turned south, east, and north. And the wheel treasure, having conquered the lands from sea to sea, returned to the royal capital and just stopped before the king's palace. And as he was trying a case as if to adorn the wrong, the royal palace, he stopped and went inside. And then it goes in another direction and explains how the wheel suddenly disappeared. And the second wheel turning monarch who came did likewise, and the third and the fourth and the fifth, a sixth and a seventh king also, and finally told a man to see if the wheel had slipped from its position, the great wheel, and seven days after the royal sage had gone forth, the wheel disappeared. So then a man came to the king and he said, sire, you should know the sacred wheel treasure has disappeared. This king was grieved and he felt sad. He did not go to the royal sage and ask him about the duties of the wheel turning monarch. Instead, he ruled the people according to his own ideas. 
and being so ruled, the people did not prosper as well as they had done under the previous kings. And he had performed the duties of the wheel turning monarch. But then the ministers, the counselors, the treasury officials, the guards, the doorkeepers, and the chanters of the mantras, they all came to the king and said, sire, as long as you rule the people according to your own ideas, and differently from the way that they were ruled before under previous the wheel-turning monarchs, the people will not prosper so well. And he went on and talked about all the people that would be affected in the realm, including ourselves, who have preserved the knowledge of how the wheel-turning monarch should rule. Ask us, your majesty, and we will tell you. And then the king, he ordered all the ministers and others to come together to consult them. And he, they explained the duties of the wheel-turning monarch again. But what happened was at that time, and this is a long, long, long time ago, we're looking at the ages of the people. And this is what's kind of interesting in the sutta, where it starts to talk about um, what happened with disobeying the precepts and everything didn't go so well. And then one of the things that was happening is in all the different areas of the, of the greater kingdom, the greater empire almost, they had to procure some sharp swords. They launched murderous assaults on the villages, towns and cities and went in for highway robbery, killing the victims and cutting off their heads and terrible crimes started happening, all because there were no precepts. They were beginning to be ignored and people were not kind anymore and not supporting each other. And then in section 14, what happens here is from, from the not giving of property to the needy, from the poverty became rife all through the kingdom. And from the growth of poverty and the taking of what was not given increased from the increase of theft and the use of weapons, everything increased. And from the increase of use of weapons, the taking of life increased. And from the increase of taking life, people's lifespans decreased and their beauty decreased. And as a result of the decrease of lifespan and and beauty, the children of those whose lifespan had once been 80,000 years lived, became only 40,000. So we're talking a long, long time ago here in the Kalpas and the Mahakalpa, all this, okay? And the man of the generation that lived with 40,000 years took what was not given, and he was brought before the king. And it is true, if you took what was not given, that is called theft. And he said, the man said, no, your majesty. He was telling a deliberate lie. He knew that it was theft. And then from not giving the prop to the property to the needy and taking of life increasing and taking of life and lying increased. And with the, the increase of lying, people's lifespans decreased again and their beauty decreased. And as the result, the children of those whose lifespan had been 40,000, they lived only 20,000 years. And then it, it happens again for with the not giving of property to the needy or, and speaking evil to others, which increased. And in consequence, people's lifespans decreased, their beauty decreased, and as a result, the children of those whose lifespan had been 20,000 then lived for 10,000. And it keeps reducing from 10,000 to 5,000. And then from 5,000 to only 2,000 years. And then among the generation whose lifespan was 2,000 years, covetousness and hatred increased. And in consequence, people's lifespans decreased and their beauty decreased. And as a result, their children only lived for a thousand years. And then when the lifespan had been for a thousand years, it fell to 500 years. And after 500 to 200, and then it had been two and a, two and a half centuries, only two and a half centuries down to 100 years, which is where we're basically living now. 
and at, the time, at a time will come when the children of these people will have a lifespan of only 10 years. And with them, the girls will get married at five years old. And with them, these flavors will disappear. Ghee, butter, sesame oil, molasses, and salt will disappear. Among them, the kudrusa grain will be the chief food, just as rice and curry are today. And with them, the 10 courses of moral conduct will completely disappear, and the 10 courses of evil will prevail exceedingly. For those of a 10-year lifespan, there will be no word for moral. So how can there be anyone who acts in a moral way? And those people who have no respect for mother or father, for ascetics and Brahmins, or for the head of a clan or a leader of a country. They will be the ones who enjoy honor and prestige, but just as it is now the people who show respect for mother and father, ascetics and Brahmins, and for the head of a clan who are appraised and honored, so it will be with those who do the opposite instead. Among those of the 10 year lifespan, no account will be taken of a mother or aunt, of mother's sister-in-law, of teacher's wife, or one's father's wives, and so on. And all will be promiscuous in the world, just like goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, dogs and jackals. Among them, fierce enmity will prevail one for the other. Fierce hatred will grow, fierce anger, thoughts of killing, mother against, uh, of killing, I'm sorry. Um, mother will go against child and child against mother, father against child and child against father, brother against brother, brother against sister. Just as the hunter feels hatred for the beast, he stalks, it will be with them. And for those of 10 years lifespan, there will come what is called to be the sword interval of seven days each year, during which time they will mistake one another for wild beasts and use sharp swords to appear in their hands. And thinking there is a wild beast, there is a wild beast, they will take each other's lives with those swords, but there will be some beings who will think, let us not kill or be killed by anyone. Let us make for some grassy thickets or jungle rest recesses, go to clumps of trees for rivers hard to ford or inaccessible mountains and live on roots and fruits in the forest. And this they will do for seven days. Then at the end of the seven days, they will emerge from their hiding places and they will rejoice of one accord saying, good blessings, good beings, good blessings. I see that you are alive. And then the thought will occur to these beings. You know, it is only because we became addicted to evil ways that we suffered such loss of our kindred. So let us now do good. What good things can we do? Let us abstain from the taking of life and let us have, having undertaken this good thing, we shall practice it. And through having un undertaken such wholesome things, they will increase the lifespan and beauty. So now the lifespan is going to increase again. It'll start to increase now after that point of the lowest point. And the children of those whose lifespan was only 10 years will live for 20 years. And then lifespans will begin to increase. Then it will occur to those beings, it is through having taken to wholesome practices that we have increased our lifespan and beauty. Let us perform still more wholesome practices. Let us refrain from taking what is not given, 
from sexual misconduct, from lying speech of any kind, from slander, from harsh speech, from idle chatter, from covetousness, from ill will, from wrong views, let us abstain from three things, incest, excessive greed, and deviant practices. Let us respect our mothers and fathers, ascetics and Brahmins, and the head of the clan, and let us persevere in these wholesome actions. Now they're coming back into balance and driven by the precepts leading them that way. And so they'll do these things. And on account of this, they'll increase the lifespan. And the children of those whose lifespan is 20 years will live to be 40 and their children will live to be 80, their children to be 160. Their children will live for 300 and 20 years. Their children will live, will be 640 and the children whose life spans at 640 years will live on to be 2000 years. And it goes up again. It goes all the way up to attain 80,000 years. So there seems to be a cycle in the story, a cycle in the whole prophecy of how this all happened before and will happen and then happen and then happen. Among the people with the 80,000 year lifespan, the girls will become marriageable at 500 years. And such people will know only three kinds of disease, greed, fasting, and old age. That will be their dis-ease. And in the time of those people, the continent of Jambudikpa will be powerful and prosperous and villages, towns, and cities will be but a cock's fly from one to the next. And the, there will be a place like Avicii which will be as thick with people as the jungle is thick with reeds and rushes. And at the time of Waranasi of today will be a royal city that is called Ketumati, powerful and prosperous, crowded with people, well supplied. It will be a prosperous city, very grand. And there will be 84,000 cities headed by Ketumati as the royal capital. There will arise in the world a blessed Lord, an Arahat, fully enlightened Buddha, whose name will be Maitreya, endowed with wisdom and conduct, a welfarer, knower of the world's incomparable trainer of men to be tamed and a teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed, just as I am now. And he will thoroughly know by his own super knowledge and proclaim the universe with its devas and maras and brahmas, its ascetics and brahmins, and this generation with its princes and people, just as I do now. He will teach the Dhamma lovely in the beginning, lovely in the middle, lovely in the end. In the spirit and in the letter and proclaim just as I do now holy life in its fullness and purity. He will be attended by a company of thousands of monks, just as I am attended by a company of hundreds of monks. And they listen to the whole story. Monks will be islands unto yourselves in the future, be a refuge unto yourselves. With no other refuge, let the Dhamma be your island. Let the Dhamma be your refuge with no other refuge. Now, the one important note about this, if you're gonna to go to an island and make it your refuge, make sure that you know the instructions and have a strong meditation. When you go there and push the boat away, it's important. And how does a monk dwell as an island unto himself? Here a monk abides, contemplating the body as body, ardent, clearly aware and mindful, having put away any thoughts and fretting for the world. He abides contemplating feelings as feelings. And then he abides contemplating mind as mind. He abides 
contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully clearly aware and mindful, having put away any hankering and fretting for the world. Keep to your own preserves, monks, to your ancestral haunts. If you do, your lifespan will increase, your beauty will increase, your health and happiness will increase, your wealth will increase, your power will increase. And what is length of life for a monk? Here, a monk develops the road to power, which is concentration of intention accompanied by effort of will. Sounds very much like twin. The road to power, which is concentration of energy, the road to power, which is concentration of consciousness, the road to power, which is concentration of investigation accompanied by effort and will. By frequently practicing these four roads to power, he can, if he wishes, live for a full century or the remaining part of a century, that is what I call the length of life of a monk. So you can live up to a century if you are practicing right effort of your will, practicing your energy balance, practicing the proper use of your consciousness, and practicing concentration of investigation accompanied by effort and will. For the monk, what is beauty for a monk? Here a monk practices right conduct and is restrained according to the discipline, is perfect in behavior and habits, sees danger in the slightest fault and trains in the rules of training he has undertaken. That is the beauty for a monk. What is happiness for a monk? A monk detached from sense desires enters in the first jhana and the second, third, and fourth, purified by equanimity and mindfulness. This becomes the happiness for the monk. And what is the wealth for the monk? Here the monk with his heart filled in loving kindness, he dwells suffusing a quarter, the second quarter, third and fourth quarter, and thus he dwells, suffusing the whole world upwards, downwards, across, everywhere, always with a mind filled with loving kindness, abundant, unbounded, without hate or ill will. And then with his heart filled with compassion, with his heart filled with sympathetic joy or empathetic joy, with his heart filled with equanimity. He dwells suffusing the world upwards, downwards, across and everywhere, always with a mind filled with equanimity, abundant, unbounded, without hate or ill will. And that is the wealth for the monk. And what is the power of the monk? The power for a monk. This monk, by the destruction of the corruptions, enters into and abides in the corruptionless liberation of heart and liberation by wisdom, which he has attained in this very life by his own super knowledge and realization of the true nature of everything, of how everything actually works. And this is the real power of the monk. And what is the hardest? Monks, I do not consider any power so hard to conquer as the power of Mara. It is just by this building up of wholesome states that this merit increases and Mara is conquered. And thus the Lord spoke and the monks were delighted and rejoiced in his words. So what we really heard in here was what happened way back if everything was not abided by, and we heard the foundation of what the Buddha was actually talking about and teaching when he was uh, giving, he was talking about um, uh, the precepts protecting you and all matters of ways of protecting yourself and even explaining those four pieces of what was this for the monk, what was that for the monk at the end. It's all 
laid out in a description. Now, now I want to show you, I'm going to pull out a couple of um, uh, pieces to put up for you so you can follow. You may, you should have gotten them, I think, for, um, let's make sure this is here. Okay. First, I'll go get it. Um, to go in here and find it for you. Get it. There we go to government. We have to go to the section on government in the writings in the section of government under topics, governments and Buddhism. And we're going to look first um, All right, that's not the one I want. I'm sorry. Let's see. Okay, here first, let me get this up for you. I have to minimize this for a minute. Come back to you. Uh huh. Come back to you. <laughs> Come back to you and get on the screen. Go find this. Okay. So now this is research uh, that I pulled up, but it's also from research that was put together by the late uh, uh, most venerable Keshri Dhammananda from the Brickfield Temple in Malaysia. He's deceased now. And he was he's our teacher, Bunti Vimala Ramsey, spent three years with him um, in Malaysia and was exposed. And, and Keshri Dhammananda really is to me, fantastic because he wrote so many books that were reachable for anyone to read, anybody, and they can understand it whether they are Buddhist or non-Buddhist, it doesn't matter. So first thing that he brought up was that, um, let's see if I can read this here, I can't read it that way. Okay, I hope you can see this, but I'll just read it. He pulls out of this sutta, there are five parts here that come out of the sutta we just went into that touched on the guidelines for good government. Equality, he, he broke every rule, the Buddha broke every rule in the book about caste systems while he was alive. <laughs> so as soon as he was dead, uh, the Brahmins got to work seriously infiltrating Buddhism at, at this way and that way and attempting to swing it all around um, to the male dominated structure but it, it was before it was um, all over again, tried to take it back to the male, male setup, the male uh, domination. And one of the reasons was because he actually allowed the bakunis to come into being. And before that, the women were in a status, basically cattle. I mean, they, were, they didn't have any rights really in operation of things. They could influence people, but they didn't have personal power over anything in the system. So the second one is social cooperation in the time of a King, King Ashoka because of Buddhism during the golden age of India when, when Buddhism was a high priority within the morals and ethics of Buddhism, everyone got pro prosperous and there was a widespread opportunities and widespread happiness because of what Ashoka did as the empire, the emperor at that time. The rule of law, the reasonable swift law, teaching that throughout in different different setups and everything, different examples, you hear about the reasonableness of swift law. In many countries who set, tried to set up a system of swift uh, punishment so that if, now you hear about people going to jail for some terrible crime and they end up sitting there without being tried, maybe a year 18 months long before they even can come to trial. And it doesn't work, you know, if the system is not swift in taking care of things, then sometimes things can just not be resolved. They are not going to be resolved properly. 
um, the spirit of consultation um, rather than execution, the spirit of consultation. Instead of just executing something without talking to anybody, without consulting, without finding out what really happened in law is very dangerous and then backfires. It comes back on the government if the law is handled totally improperly. And the other thing about consultation is for a monarch or any leader, if they open to, if they remain open to listening to the people and the people have an input. Now, the only way this can work is if we put the input forward into them, <laughs> the people who are you know, elected or the people in power, and they really are listening to us. And the only way that we can know that is if when they decide to do something, the people must see and hear and then see the reflection in what was they decided to do about something. They need to know they were listened to. That's the bottom line. So whatever you decide to do, they need to see what they suggested to you in what you decided to do. I think that's the best way to describe it. Then everything is very powerful. If it's not that you're, if you are trying to reach out and, and beg for change and try for change and walk for change and rally for change, but you never feel like you're listened to and nothing, it's just a down, downturn for the government. It's a, it's a downturn that gets worse and worse and worse. The moralization and responsibility um, from the government, this is the fifth point, affects the use of public power. It, it is what, if it's moral and it's just, and people are picking it up and being responsible, it all works. But if they want to pass the buck, they don't want to take part and it's immoral. And a lot of immoral things in the world right now are happening amongst leaders. It's really sad. And the people lose respect for that. And then we play people against each other. So we cannot even follow right now it's very difficult because we cannot even follow what's really happening uh, in situations because our press has been controlled by the people that bought this station, bought that station. Uh, I remember a number of years ago, Venerable Bimala Ramsey, I drove him across the United States. I like small radio stations. And most people don't know this, but those stations were all bought across the entire country and, and then they were torn out inside all the equipment and the only thing that can be go on the air anymore is canned shows, taped, pre-taped shows and you hear a DJ, but nothing is naturally, there's nothing that's not pre-recorded. You can't just get on there and communicate anymore to your community. Uh, in the days when I was a chamber of commerce president, which would have been back in the um, early 1990s, we could still do that. We could, we could get on the radio and talk each week to all of the people who own shops and companies and merchants and everything. And we could bring them in for an interview and they could stop by the radio station, say, could you ask the Chamber of Commerce president to come? I would go down and we would interview them to tell us about their business if they're new in the community. All of that is gone. All of it is gone. Only control is control. And the thing about controlling, the, the excuse for controlling is I can keep you safer if I control everything. But when you control everything, there is nothing natural to happen anymore. That's the sad part. Now, the other thing that comes out of this, uh, this one sutta influences these other 10 points. And I think these are, yeah, here we go. The Jataka, the Jataka tale called uh, the Dasa Raja Dharma, which is very famous for explaining the rules of government uh, that were expressed by the Buddha to influence rulers. And all of this stuff seems to still work. You, you should, when we, I'll go down through them and then we can talk a little bit about this briefly. But you see, these guidelines, if we kept to these guidelines, these 10 guidelines, we'd be in great shape. And we had a, a conversation between the people and the government, but that, that, that isn't what's happening right now, pretty widely spread throughout the, the uh, world. And so we keep 
wanting to say it's happening, but pretty soon people are beginning to realize that's just what somebody is saying. And they keep trying to make it happen. There's always hope it can turn around and it can happen better in the future. But here's what he told us for sensible guidelines. You ready? Number one, be liberal and avoid selfishness. So to, um, to basically uh, avoid selfishness, this is really a uh, true thing. I'm going to make these a little bigger so that you all can see them better. Okay, how's that? Right? Okay, be liberal and avoid selfishness. That's a good piece of advice. To be liberal and to avoid selfish and self-determination in everything that you're doing without talking to anybody is very selfish. And, and trying to do it your way. And you heard in the sutta what happened. Everything started to go down. From there, it started to go down, 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 down. And everything increased with the absence of the people uh, being able to be heard. Second one was maintain a high moral character. Well, we just need to go around and see who's in charge. And we all know there's a lot of things happening. There are. Uh, that the moral character of our leaders today and the morality across the board is a variant from really great to really, really poor. And every shadow is there. So we have to look for ourselves to see what's going on and try to determine what's true about the person. The third one is be prepared to, this saying this to the leader, be prepared to sacrifice one's own pleasures for the well-being of the subjects. And this does not mean in appearances only. It means for real, sacrifice what you want to do personally and play the leadership role or the representative role properly. You don't get to get elected and then say, I say to you, congratulations for being elected. What are you gonna do now that you're elected? And a young man who was elected in Central Virginia one time, who was only 21 years old, he was selected on a council, was in a car uh, going down to Richmond and I was in the car and I just said to him, well, what are you gonna do now? And he turned to me and he said, anything I want. And I thought, wow, wow. <laughs> I was shocked that he said it, but that's exactly what he said. I'll do anything I want to do. That's a very poor attitude once you're put in leadership. So be honest and maintain absolute integrity. Don't get involved. If you say something, if you say something, um, if you say something and um, if you say something, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm still teaching. I'm still teaching. Okay, I'm sorry. Be honest and maintain absolute integrity. Don't go outside your integrity. Be honest, forthright, talk about things that are real, keep things honest. Be kind and be gentle. There's nothing wrong with being kind and gentle. It doesn't mean you need to be tough and macho. Kind and gentle goes a lot further through the entire population. And then lead a simple life for the subjects to emulate. This is something we've gotten away from. And in many countries, we have no idea where the tax money goes or what happens in living situations of some of the representatives in various countries of the world are just totally out of proportion. So what are people to think when some people cannot even afford a tiny, a tiny space to live and someone who is the leader of the country is building a huge palace with the tax money of the country. So it's case for upset when that starts happening, definitely. Be free from hatred of any kind. If you're in office, you have an obligation, in my opinion, to do some forgiveness meditation and clear your mind, cleanse your mind of any hatred outright for someone and open your mind to possibilities for the future. Imagine how brilliant and how smart and intelligent human beings are, and yet we seem caught in repeating cycles over and over and over again. Next one is to, to exercise nonviolence first before anything else, nonviolent 
remedies for things and not just simply go for violence. And in this world right now, there are some reasons why we see violence happen. And many times it is for the sake of greed and money and prospering from war. And that's a very sad thing in modern history. I hope that I could live to see that stop, but I'm hoping my grandchildren will live to see that stop. Practice patience. Patience is one thing that brings many of the results we want to have come to us. Patience, uh, practicing patience is the way to a clear mind. Patience is the way to equanimity. Patience is the way to experiencing Nibbana, the opening of the mind, the letting go, patience. And then you let go of such concern for things that are already past, such worries for the future, and then respect public opinion to promote peace and harmony. This is where public opinion has to be heard and it should be responded to. And then decisions can be made. As I said earlier, the monarch who is the smartest one in the situation, the very smartest one is the one who can as a leader produce a solution. And when we go to work out that solution, maybe as many people as possible are guided by the, the Eightfold Path uh, parts as they're working together or whatever religion provides commandments, laws or whatever that is similar to that, everybody is living by that as they work together to come out with a solution in the end. So these were the 10 pieces that seem to be evident and played out. And um, you can look up, I think you can look up the Dasa Raja Dharma uh, Jataka to actually read the whole story. This is the excerpts that were taken out of it by uh, Venerable Keshri Dhammananda. And the other um, part up here was taken, drawn out of the Chakavati Sutta that we examined. I'm sending you four support pages for you to look a little bit further. And one of those um, that is really nice is the part, the Buddha's advice to govern a kingdom by Keshri Dhammananda. That's a short piece that's very enjoyable to read. It's only about 2,600 words. It's just not that long, maybe five pages long. It's quite good. Uh, then there's also a 10 page one I'm giving you on being a government, uh, this is about being a government leader. It's a Buddhist contribution to good governance. And this is actually a treatise, I think that was done probably for his master's degree, but I, I don't know if it was, it's 10 pages long. And it was done by Ajahn Brahm. And this one goes into, um, to point out some interesting things. And one of the things he says about it is in the introduction, he lays out that the Buddhist contribution to good governance um, gives us a picture of the oldest multinational corporation in the world, which is the Buddhist Sangha and how it operates. He goes into this subject and talks a little bit about it. He says that leaders have three subjects to master. There are skills in leadership, the first one, the second one is the skill in decision making. The third one is the skills in problem solving. And he backs it all up by what the Buddha was teaching and what he said. And they in decision making and problem solving, he also leans in the direction of arbitration can be solved by using the Four Noble Truths as a mechanism for peacemaking where there are problems in companies, groups, communities, or anything. And he emphasizes the Eightfold Path. He mentions dependent origination and your practice within it. So that's the talk for tonight. Let's open up the floor for anybody who wants to ask a question and just um, see these. Uh, I think these are where we can get them. Isn't that right, Dhamma, uh, Bhante Dhamma Gavesi? They can get these pages wherever they'd like to get them, right? Uh, once again. Yeah, yeah. This this is uh, uh, available on uh, this thing, uh, Google Drive. I have put them up. I I have shared the uh, links on the website. Uh, sorry, our uh, uh, twin group. I'll share okay. it also. 
Okay. Then uh, there are four documents, or I think five documents. Those are available. I'll uh, share this with uh, everyone over here in the group also. Yeah, two of those documents, we went over them, those lists, the five points and the 10 points. The other two are Keish Damananda's um, talk that he gave. It was a great big talk. We thousands of people there for that one. And then uh, the other one is the 10 page uh, thesis that was by Ajay Ram. So you have any question about this, anybody? Wow, <laughs> okay. So I really honestly tried to make this as close to an hour as I could. I think I may have done it, not quite sure, um, but I hope so. And if you, yeah, is it close to it? Yeah. It's close to an hour now. That's, well, that's good. Okay. So um, I did break out of the suit. I just took the sections I wanted to read to you. But if you have any questions about it, I think it's really interesting uh, for me to see the picture that was painted by what the Buddha taught in relationship to what I see going on in digging further and further back in archaeology that mm -hmm. there's no telling how old the idea of civilization actually was and what we've actually done on this planet. There really isn't. Gotepi uh, temple, which is considered the oldest temple on the earth, I think it's 35,000 years is the e estimate for that, 35,000 years back, okay? And um, when you look at the way this is set up in hundreds of thousands of years, I used to wonder, I used to think maybe it was all different back then. Maybe years were shorter. What do you think, Bonte? <laughs> no, I think these are the same uh, years, uh, human years. And uh, th this has been uh, in one of the suttas, Buddha mentions that uh, uh, there is a monk who uh, uh, tells his uh, uh, disciples that life is uh, just like a bubble uh, in the water, uh, in the rain which is formed. That a bubble comes and goes. And that time the life span was 100,000 years. So that's yeah. uh, so yeah. 100,000 years the, when the lifespan is there, there uh, you are considered the uh, life as a bubble and you are uh, uh, urged to kind of uh, spend your time on uh, this thing uh your uh, meditation and the practice so more so over here when uh, our lifespan is just 100 years so our lifespan now is based on 100 years for our actuarial tables and life insurance based all on 100 years you can see kind of where that's putting us in relationship when it describes this is what touched me when it starts describing for the people that are 100 years, it, it, it could start going up again from here. But um, explaining how it was going at that time is really being reflected with what's going on in the world. So you can see how on target this was, was surprising to me. When I, when I went to read it, I was, I was surprised by it. So if you have any questions, feel free to send an email to either Dhamma Gavesi um, or myself. And I think the, the emails are probably put on the talks, I think, for questions or something. I don't know when they're listed. Is that true? There is a uh, description. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, put, uh, the contact and our uh, website. Uh, okay. So I think that's um, something to consider. You know, It's just real interesting. So if you have any questions, please get back with us, okay? And let's do our prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. And may they long protect Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> it's trying, touching something. <laughs> it tries very hard. <laughs>